And welcome everybody and glad to see you. Uh, we're here on Sunday night for Feasting on the Word. And uh, we want to welcome everybody in person or on online. We're glad to have you here with us. Like I said, I always say this, if you get down here in person, you can have a lot of food. That makes it even better feasting. Um, Zach, I think I'll do Hark. The Herald of Angels Sing. I got a couple of Christmas songs, but they still have the Word of God in them. Hark the Herald Angels Sing.
13 years, Act. There we go. <coughs> well, we have made it to the last lesson in this series. On the last Sunday night service in the year of 2022. And it has just, it has just worked out beautifully and uh, the title of this lesson is how to be close to God forever and in essence we're coming to the end of Moses' life and although Moses did some awesome awesome things by the power and through the power of the Holy Spirit he was not a perfect man not by any means. But his desire for an intimate relationship with God is unparalleled in the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy 34, verse 12, God said to him, For no one ever has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. There would never be another one like Moses. And in the book of Deuteronomy, it, it basically, his final words and deeds 
are record are recorded in the book of Deuteronomy, and that Deuteronomy means second law or repetition of the law. And so, just before his death, Moses gives his farewell address, which bring together the laws recorded in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. And this compilation is what we call the book of Deuteronomy, and, and it's quoted, believe it or not, almost a hundred times in the New Testament more than any other Old Testament book. And all three of the scriptures that Jesus used to resist temptation come from the book of Deuteronomy, which uh, obviously Jesus had memorized. Well, since he technically was the author of it, I think he probably could have it all memorized, right? And uh, But uh, Jesus said in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, the greatest of all commandments is found in Deuteronomy there. And it is. What's it I get going here? Do I go up? There we go. You shall love the Lord, your God. You shall love Jehovah, your God. Remember what I said about if, if it's all capital letters, it's Jehovah, all right, or Yahweh Have, or Jehovah. So you shall love Jehovah, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And so by learning about the last few days of Moses and through his death, we can learn how to be close to God forever. And it requires two things to be close. One, we need to actively obey God's word. And then the last one is we always need to be, we must always be ready to die. So let's go to number one here. First, we must actively obey God's word. Now we know, we know <clears throat> that Moses has his moments, his weak moments. But despite everything, he didn't give up, and he obeyed God to the end. The last few months of his life are filled with hard work. He prepares for his death by writing the de in, in detail all the law God had given him. And just before his death, he writes in a book the words of this law from beginning to end and gives it to the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. That's in Deuteronomy 31. And it says, the words of the law, from beginning to end, refers to Deuteronomy, which is to be kept beside the Ark of the Covenant, not in it. Now, that's interesting. Uh, now, what do you mean? Well, according to nine, Hebrews 9, verse 4, three things were kept in the Ark. They were. It had the golden, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid with all, on all sides with gold, in which were... The golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Remember, we talked about the fact that these tablets were the ones that Moses had to inscribe because the first ones that God had used with, written with his own finger were destroyed. So then, this is interesting, and I had to go back. Uh, some people call um, chapter 32 uh, a sermon, which you can which you can say... That's true. But it also says he sings a song. So is he is he uh, singing the last sermon? Uh, that's I don't think that's important, but it is one of those deep deep thick questions that you that, that I like to ask. But in, in essence, what it's it, what it does it, it reminds the Israelites uh, of their obligation to obey the Lord and of certain judgments if they do not. Okay, so in other words, this this song or sermon, whatever you want to call it, it, it says you're obliged to obey the Lord. And here's what's going to happen if you don't. And then after the song, Moses says to the people, he says, take to heart all the words I have solemnly declared to you this day, so that you may command your children to obey carefully all the words of this law. They're not just idle words for you. For, they're not just idle words for you. They are for your life. By them you will live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. And when, you, when we refer to God's words, Moses say they are your life. The best way 
To be close to God forever is to actively obey His Word. Now, it's not easy. But my comment to that is nothing worth anything is easy. It takes work. It takes diligence. It takes practice. It takes perseverance. It takes not giving up. Even when you mess up, get off your get off your knees or off your backs or wherever you're at and just keep on going, pressing towards the prize. That's the best way I can describe it. Moses knew that sin is fun for a season. He knew that, you know, hey, I know sin's fun. And if it wasn't, nobody would sin, right? Now Moses could have had a lot of fun at, at, at Pharaoh's palace when he was when he was living there. I mean he was in line he was in he was in the line of of, of the of the Pharaoh. I mean he could have had it, I mean he could have he could have partied like it was 1999. That's the only way I can kind of describe it. Uh, he could he could have partied. Uh, he could have lived a life of wealth and luxury. He could have let, let, lived a life of power. But Moses decided to do something else. And in Hebrews 11, verse 25, here's what he decided to do. He says, Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. The way to be close to God is found in his word. Now, if you could go to heaven right now and ask Moses, was the 40 years in the wilderness worth it? What do you think he'd say? I, yeah. When it comes to God's word, we have two choices and only two choices. Obey it and live or disobey and die. That's it. Um, it's not enough to say we're Christians. To read the Bible or be religious. Remember, the definition for religious is the worship of anything. Remember, when we do something repeatedly <laughs> or with fervor, we can say, oh, I do, I, I do this religiously. Got to be careful with that. Fan is short for fanatic, right? Right. <laughs> if you're a fan of something... I think that means came from the word fanatic. Yeah, okay, that's good. That's good. That's real good. Jesus reveals the way to be close to God forever. In Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. That's a scary verse. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. God's will is revealed in his word. And being close to him requ forever requires more than just believing certain things in Jesus as Lord. To be close to God forever, we must actively obey his word, which takes work and diligence and perseverance and prayer and sometimes suffering. Sometimes we have to walk through the valley of shadow of death for the Lord to get his um, yes, his point across. Exactly, exactly. So we need to actively obey God's word. And second, we must always be ready to die. Well, wow, that's kind of that's kind of sick, Greg. No, just check us out. On the on the same day, on the same day. The Lord tells Moses, he says, Go up to Mount Nebo in Moab across from Jericho and view Canaan, the land I am giving to Israel, giving the Israelites as their own possession. There on the mountain that you have climbed, you will die and be gathered to your people. Imagine if you're Moses and God says, Okay, climb up the mountain, you're going to get to see the promised land, and then you're going to die. And you know, I'm not. I'm not sure to go hooray or or oh my. You know, I don't know. But this is what God said. To which he obeyed, and Moses is gathered to his people. So who are his people? Well, how about Adam and Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham, and Isaac and Joseph? But more importantly, how about God? 
They've all been patiently waiting for Moses to come home. And Moses' task was done. And since it is done, his task is finished, God's going to bring him safely to his people. So Jesus teaches in Luke 23, 43, that as soon as we die, we immediately go with, to be with our people. What do you mean? We'll take a look. Jesus said in Luke, and Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's pretty cool. So in chapter 33, there in Deuteronomy, Moses blesses the tribe of Israel, then climbs Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the top of Pisgah across from Jericho. Now, Pisgah probably refers to the ridge that crowds Mount Nebo. And Mount Nebo is a mountain east of Jericho, and it's the highest in that mountain range out there. So from there, God shows Moses the whole land. Now, although you can see from a high place a lot over there, uh, it says it says that God shows him the whole land. So God gives Moses supernatural vision there, and he sees the whole land from north to the south as far as the western sea, which is the Mediterranean, and then after showing Moses the promised land, here's what God says to him in Deuteronomy 34, verse 4. He says, Then the Lord said to him, This is the land which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have caused you to see it with your own eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Well, why not? Well, we got to go back to Numbers chapter 20. After they wandered the desert for 38 years, and basically because they did not believe when they sent the 12 spies across the land, God said, if you're 20 years of age or older, you are not crossing into the promised land. So they had to wander for 38 years. Hey, Delbert. Delbert. Got some chili in your, chili, <laughs> chili in your food catcher there. Honey. You're welcome. I'm sitting there looking at him just go, Boops. and I didn't lose my train of thought. Either. Hey, all right, I'm glad you did <laughs> So anyway, the next generation, it's time for them to go to the promised land. But, but, oh, I hate that word. There's no water, and the people begin to rebel. And so God tells Moses to assemble the people and speak to the rock. Before their eyes, and it's going to pour out water. But Moses' temper kicks in, and he strikes the rock twice. And as a result, here's what the Lord says. He says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me, to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I give them. Moses couldn't go to the promised land because he disobeyed God in anger. Well, does it seem... Too severe. Well, if Moses had only spoken to the rock as God had commanded, then this miracle would have caused the people to focus their attention on God's love, power, and faithfulness. However, when Moses struck the rock in anger, he took the glory and honor from God, and he dishonored the Lord by demonstrating in front of the entire nation that basically he wasn't worthy, worthy to be obeyed precisely <clears throat> to which this wasn't just a little bitty incident it was a pretty big deal and it entered him from it prevented him from entering the promised land but despite that Moses was ready to do whatever the Lord wanted and that meant dying even even without entering the promised land and he did so without complaint. That in itself is amazing. He just he, he just he accepted what what God said, and he just went with it. But he did get to see the promised land, and he knew when and where he was going to die. Now, what's interesting? What's interesting? is it's God who buries Moses. The people didn't bury Moses. God did. 
And then if you look a little bit further in the scriptures, you'll find out that there was a great big fight yes. <laughs> over Moses' dead body. Which from angelic from angelic beings. <laughs> Well, why? Well, there's lots of conjectures there. But I personally believe that Moses is going to be one of the two witnesses in the book of Revelation, him and Elijah. Now, some would say, some would say Enoch and, uh, and somebody else because they, they physically didn't die. But I believe, but I believe it's it's going to be Elijah and Moses, because Moses, God gave him the ability to split the Red Sea, and Elijah called down fire from heaven. And if you look in that passage of scripture, you'll see there's going to be a lot of fire and water during that three and a half years when those three witnesses are are going to be testifying to the Lord. Two witnesses. Two, yeah, two witnesses. It does state in Revelation, though, that those two witnesses will be those prophets that had the ability or given the, the ability to stop the rain. Right. That sounds like Elijah. Which, right? which was what Elijah did. And that's, uh, that, you know, we don't know that maybe Enoch didn't. All the old church uh, fathers, the original ones, that were taught by John and them all kind of as we record the two you mentioned, Elijah. Well, some of them, some they use a, they use a Hebrews nine twenty seven or you know you know for it's the point of man wants to die and then judgment and since Enoch and uh, Elijah Elijah up to him. right since since they didn't since they didn't die they figured it's going to be those two I tend to believe want to get killed in yeah I, I, right and I tend to I tend, tend to believe too but I'm trying not to get off the subject but. We also see uh, Moses again in the Transfiguration, which we'll kind of get to here in a minute. Yes. But uh, he gets to see the Promised Land. Uh, many, many say that you know if people would have known where God buried Moses, they would have made a shrine over his grave and worshipped it. Which that does make sense, okay? Um, but Deuteronomy thirty-four seven says this about Moses' death. It says Moses was one hundred and twenty years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural vigor diminished. When he died, his, his strength wasn't gone. For God promises, your strength will equal your days, according to Deuteronomy 33, 25. This means for every day God has given us to live, he'll also give us the strength to do his will that day. Um, in that, in the Bible, this is a, one person's definition, that supernatural strength is called grace. And I can believe that. But I also believe it's, I, it, it could just be called supernatural strength. Um, God way. Either way, exactly. So Moses' life, if, if, it could basically be divided into three periods. 40 years in, the, in Pharaoh's palace, 40 years as a shepherd in Midian, and 40 years leading Israel in the wilderness. Now the rod Moses used to work many miracles, it just it lay still. The man whose voice had prayed more than once to save his people is silent. The man who wanted to know God intimately on earth is now in God with heaven. Well, the people weep for Moses for 30 days. <coughs> now, what's interesting is Moses, like most good people, were far more appreciated after he was gone than while he was alive. And isn't that true? Um... Like I said, this isn't the last time we see Moses in the Bible. Let's look at Matthew 17, 2 and 3 there, where it says, And he was transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him, talking with Jesus. I just thought, I just think that's really cool. Uh, Chuck Missler says, well, they were just having a staff meeting. Uh, preparing for what was to come down the road. Either way, I find it interesting. I find it interesting that the Holy Spirit made sure when Jesus was transfigured that the other two people were mentioned by name. Uh, I don't think 
and that and I and we talked about the, the two witnesses in Revelation. I, I think that's important, and I think I think the Holy Spirit doesn't leave out any detail, and uh, and and some scholars say that Moses represented the law and Elijah the prophets because Christ would fulfill both. That's kind of an interesting thought there, and that's and that's true. Um, personally, I think there's a little bit more to that, um, but I digress. But through Moses' death, we can learn how to be close to God forever, and it requires it requires the two things that we've been talking about tonight: actively obeying God's word and always being ready to die. I mean, you know, we all have, and as, as, and as I've said from the beginning, the Bible characters that we hold so dear, they weren't any different than you and me. <coughs> they all had faults. They all had good qualities. They all persevered. And you and I, can do just as awesome things as they did if we're obedient. Also, you mean that, you know, I could split the Red Sea? If God says so, you could. Um, however, however, as we've been kind of talking about for a while now. Sometimes we just have to be obedient in the little bitty things. Not everybody's called to do these great, mighty, marvelous things. Some of us might be called to dig a ditch or sweep a floor or uh, provide food to um, a needy person or to provide comfort or a listening ear. Every time that we share the good news of Jesus Christ with a lost person and they choose to accept that free gift, we witness the greatest miracle of all. Do you realize that you are a true miracle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you heard the good news, realized you were a sinner, asked Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sin and to be the Lord of your life. Do you realize that you have participated in the greatest miracle of all time? Of all time. But if you want want to be intimate with God, it, it really is just a series of choices. Each and every day, we have the choice. Do we want to be the person that God wants us to be, or do we want to enjoy the temporary pleasures of sin? That's what it boils down to. So, what is it that you want to do with the rest of your life? Now, we can go back and look at all the things we've done in the past. We can't bring them back. We can repent of them and ask forgiveness of those. And then we just need to go on. Because the bottom line is the breath I just took, I can't get back. The thoughts that I have in my head, I can't get back. But what I can do is choose to focus my eyes on the Savior. And this season, this Christmas season, is a perfect opportunity for us, as I kind of shared this morning a little bit, to think about what it really means for this baby to be born. Who had to live, who had to be born of a virgin, because if he was born of parents, that he would have inherited Adam's sin nature. The fact that this baby boy lived a sinless life. I don't know how he did it. 
But he did it. And willingly, willingly gave up his own life so that you and I could have salvation and freedom and eternal life. That beautiful baby boy that we celebrate <coughs> was born <coughs> to sacrifice himself for us. The only Sacrifice that could be possible so that you and I could even have a chance to go to heaven. And if we have accepted that free gift that Jesus gives us one day, we'll get to talk to Moses. And Elijah, I mean, we're going to be there forever. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure, if you look at the book of Revelation, you know, there's not going to need for, we're not going to need to sleep. We're going to have, a, we're going to have a, a, a new body. I mean, the, the, in heaven, it's going to be God's light. It's going to be shown all the time. So this is not going to need any sleep, and it's going to be forever. I'm sure Moses will be able to pencil in a little time with this, you know. Um, and we can ask him those questions. I had a feeling, though, that according to the Scripture, we're going to see Jesus as he really is. I, I, I tend to think we're already going to know what, what happened and, and why it happened. And we'll be able to see probably through some kind of supernatural uh, video vision or something, uh, of the story and how it happened. And we'll just, and, you know, it'll, just, it'll just blow our minds in a new way, just like the Lord blows our minds now. So as we finish this series, I hope that um, you were blessed by it, and I hope that... Um, I hope that you learned a few things. I certainly did. Well, this awesome thought, Greg, might be that you're still teaching when you get to heaven, and this new group of people that just passed away and came to get there, you get to tell them about everything. Cool. One of the things that I think Jesse was trying to said when he was in heaven, one of the things that really stood out to him was that there were groups of people sitting around a large school and questioning the Lord as to what was this. Why are they sitting around in old groups? And he said, I could, didn't know them. He said, but I knew that were the old patriarchs. He said, I knew there, there were Peter and Elijah and Enoch and all these people teaching that were people. the ones teaching them. And he said, what are they doing? And he said, they're teaching them because they, they didn't know. They're teaching they them <laughs> what, what, what it was and what happened. So that come to my mind immediately when you said that. <laughs> cool. <laughs> All right, in 2023, uh, I'm pretty sure that the Lord is leading me into a study of hell. And it's uh, it's based on the book of Bill Weiss, the 20, he, in 23 Minutes in Hell. And uh, there's 23 questions about hell, and so it's going to be a 23-week study. So it'll be half a year. You may think, wow, that's a little... That's a little long time of being hell. <laughs> well, since it's going to be forever, you know, uh, you know, we better learn now so that we don't go there, right? Uh, so that's probably going to happen, and that will be the second week of January. So we will not have any more Sunday nights for at least two more weeks. All right, next week, of course, is Christmas. There won't be any Christmas Eve, uh, Christmas night, sir, night, Sunday nights, or the following week, which is New Year's, and uh, there won't be any service on New Year's either. So it'll be the second week of... The, yeah, just the morning services. It'll be the second week of January, and I believe that's all we're going to get started in. And it's going to be exciting. It's going to be it's going to be deep, but it's going to be scriptural. So get ready. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You said, oh, you're good job. Thank you. Huh? <laughs> I said, amen, and all you suckers dig in. Okay. <laughs> so that's January 8th. Is the January 8th. will be the first one. All right, now we'll get to the next one. Practicing really, really good. Thank you. It's literally just whatever kind of ground meat you want to use. I use sauce. Yeah, she's going to read.